Hey everybody, Pete A. Turner from the Break It Down Show. Today's guest is a friend of mine, Don Vandergriff, and he specializes in something called Mission Command. Mission Command is a military term and very Clausewitzian, and if you're getting lost on that, just know this about Mission Command. It's, it's the opposite of micromanagement, and what Don has focused on in his career is trying to help primarily the military services, but uh, also foreign militaries and businesses understand how do you communicate your mission and your desired outcomes to the folks who work for and under you, and then give them the trust and capability to go out and adapt to the situation within the design of your outcome, of your goals. So you can say, hey, we're going to go out and win. But when they come up on a patrol and they're like, look, do we wait for the command to say, go ahead and engage this enemy patrol or, or do we just go ahead and do it? So mission command, I guess, would say, go ahead and do it. Engage that enemy command, take the land and dominate because you're acting with that trust, with that mission command. So we'll get more about it from Don. He actually was on the show early on, I think guest 26. And today he is 595, 596, something like that. So almost 500 episodes between our visits with Don. He's written three books on mission command. You can get all of them on Amazon. Just look up Don Vandergriff. And if you can't find him, let me know. I'm glad to do it. Uh, best way to support the show, share the show, buy the t-shirts, uh, participate, conversate. Hey, here's the thing I really want you to do. Send me a picture and I'll put it into the Break It Down show form and I'm going to start building a fan graphic that we put out with the people who listen to the show, whether you're in Saudi Arabia, Japan, Tennessee, UK, France, Iowa, I don't care where you're at, send me your picture and say, hey, this is my picture, let's make a graphic and I'll, I'll put you in the bids graphic form and I'm going to build a whole new show banner over the next 500 episodes instead of just having our guests i'm going to have i have all of you because this is our show we build this together and i always want to hear what you have to say hey everybody thank you so much go to save and join us in working on ptsd click the donate tab and put a number in there and just give it each month it'll be easy i appreciate all of you here comes don vandegriff lions rock productions <laughs> This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Don Vandergriff, author of Mission Command, Leaders for a Superior Command Culture, Naval Institute Press. I'm listening to the great Break It Down show. <laughs> All right, cool. This is great. Don Vandegrift, by the way, for everybody who wants to look into the Wayback Machine, was guest number 26. Wow. And yeah, you'll be probably north of 600 by the time this one publishes because uh, we got a bit of a backlog. But, I, but I, I'm glad that we're able to do this and, and get into Mission Command. Uh, for anybody who wants to get, look at the book, it's, uh, it's available on Amazon. If you type in the words Adopting Mission Command or just Don Vandergriff, you're going to get there. And if you can't find it, just hit me up. You can get me on social media, Pete A. Turner, and I'll, I'll get you in the right spot. This is a high-end military book. So we're, we're going to have this conversation. We're going to talk about some case studies. But I, I think, Don, what's most useful for the audience is to sort of take these case studies and also apply it to day-to-day -day life so they can understand what, what I mean, because look, people in the military say the words mission command all the time without a really in-depth or a, an applicable knowledge of it. And so I want to take that same assumption and put it on uh, the civilian populace, too, that that these principles will apply to day to day business as well as it does to military. But saying them and doing them are two different things. Two incredible different uh, diverse statements. And you're right, Pete. And by the way, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Uh, they they apply the best organizations, both business, nonprofit, law enforcement, and military, are the ones that believe in their people first, like John Boyd talked about, mm -hmm. people, ideals, and hardware. But there's more to it than that. They understand how to develop them, to empower them, select them, i.e. assess them, uh, and then develop them so they can do mission command. The issue with mission command is after extensive, exhaustive 30 years of research uh, from my, for my by myself, 
but also supported by several great guys like Bruce Goodmanson, a, 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 one of the top historians you had a few months ago on your show, uh, Dr. York Muth, uh, Rob, Rob Satino, who's written a series of books, some incredible Martin Samuels. I've learned a lot from them, and they've been very gracious about helping me out with my German and my interpretation of the German when it was written. The big thing about Mission Command is you've got to understand how to develop your subordinates to do it. That's the issue. It's not like uh, what happens a lot today. Go out and do, go out and accomplish this, uh, but don't don't mess up. It's it's. But I've seen that for real happen. Hey, this is P. Dave Turner from the Break It Down Show checking in real quick to ask you this. John, Scott, and I all support Save the Brave with our time, our location, our effort, and our money. Each month, we give a small amount. Do the same with us. Go to savethebrave.org, click on the Donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. It's, it's, but I've seen that for real happen. It's also mastery of leadership and command culture language. For example, the people in either side, uh, business or military, understand that you have a priority. You set priorities. So people understand what's important. You don't go, everything's a priority. Or as I had a boss in Afghanistan go last year, oh, I've got four number one priorities. No. <laughs> yeah. You go, this is the priority, and it, uh, that's called moral courage and the strength of character to select what's important. But more than that, I give people several tools on how to develop their subordinates. Now, at the very conclusion, I say I'm not against computer simulations at all. I'm a big war gamer. But you need to master these simpler or non-technological approaches to master how to develop your people. If you take the time and the investment to, to, to develop your people on how to succeed in mission command, your, your, your organization is not only going to succeed, but you're going to enjoy doing it as a boss. You've got to have the attitude also that I'm going to make my people better than I am. If you take that uh, uh, attitude and they see that, most people, not all, but most people will say, that guy really does care for me and I'm going to work hard for them to get better. And maybe they leave and go do something else. But the issue is going to make your organization succeed. What happens generally though, is people go, I want you to go make a decision, but I want you to do it my way or the way I would do it. A big thing I've seen in the military in particular is I want you to do mission command, but I don't like the way you're going to do it. So, do it my way. Oh, I'm serious. I've seen that hundreds of times. Yeah. So it, it is funny now, but then it's like, that's not mission command or what the Germans called optics tactique, which mission command is a bad translation. It's actually empower empowerment or a power tactics uh, from the earliest uh, use of it with Frederick the great. It was used as, as a way to bond the Yonker class of Prussia to the King. The King would say, be loyal to me. The Yonkers in return to, the, the, the royalty class would say, leave me alone and do it the way you want to. So it's evolved from the 1700s to, to today. The German army later adopted it and finally accepted it as official doctrine in the 1906 uh, uh, field regulation manual uh, of, uh, of units. But and they finally mentioned it a lot. And, and they, but their, their education started uh, moving toward it in the late 1800s. 1860s, as Helmut Moltke, the great chief of staff, uh, understood the, the power of, of building people to make decisions on the spot. No, let's let's dive into that a little bit so we don't get too far past some of the cool things you're talking about. Uh, I, I guess, is it fair to say the antonym for Mission Command would be micromanagement, where you're directed to do every single thing? Or, or is there a better opposite term? I'm trying to get our hands around what it is to be Mission Command. I mean, I, I get what you're saying, but let's illustrate it. Oh, that's good. Thank you. That's a good point. Well, what what do you want to do with Mission Command? That's the big question. What what gap or what thing am I trying to accomplish with Mission Command? Well, when you develop your people to make rapid decisions, you're what you're focusing on is you're not there. You're the boss, 
but I've got a subordinate at the spot of decision, be it battle or business, and they understand what the intent or the outcome of my company or my military organization is. They're empowered to make those decisions without being punished, even if sometimes they're wrong, but they can justify it. Yeah. Now, on the opposite scale, the U.S. military adopted management science as early as 1900 from the writings of Fred- Frederick Taylorism, the great business uh, Mongol, because we did not have a standing military until after World War II. We had a cadre-based military that would raise from the National Guard militia for mass mobilization when we had a crisis like World War I and World War II. So what do we had to do? We had to adapt a mass mobilization system, an industrial system that trained people rapidly in the basics. And as well, no one really had leadership experience So they had to use a top-down form of micromanagement to make things happen. And because we won World War I and World War II without the details, what I mean by that, we won World War I because we came in real late and everyone else did the fighting for us. And then World War II, the strategic er the mass strategic arrows of our opponents, the Japanese and Germans, allowed us to come in later and then win. But we fell back on a micromanagement top-down uh, leadership doctrine, hmm. which we oversaw and we just dismissed because we won the war. Oh, we beat these mighty military powers, so we can get away with this. And then it really came to, it really did us in during the Vietnam War when personnel policies rotated people in and out of Vietnam every six months, officers, and they didn't have enough experience, so they relied on micromanagement. They didn't have the time or the unit cohesion because we used individual replacement system, another uh, another uh, evolution of Frederick Taylorism to man units. We still do it today. Yeah, yeah, we but- sure do. So taking that whole concept, uh, one of the things I've noticed from working with partnered nations is they are a lot more top-down driven than, than we even are. And, and uh, it literally paralyzes the military. I mean, just the ability to push authority and responsibility to lower levels i'm not saying all of the responsibility and authority at the ground level but just because it tends to float upwards right just by pushing it down and allowing a squad to maneuver how they need to to accomplish the mission or a company or you know whatever it's going to be where size element is and they're able to accomplish those tactical wins a lot of times done by you know like little round top just by simply showing up first you know, like you already have this huge advantage, like, hey, we should walk over there and go grab that hunk of land. This is sort of what Mission Command looks like is is instead of saying, hey, should we take a little round top? Well, let's go send a runner five miles over to get the approval for somebody who's four echelons above us. And they come back and, and you've missed the initiative. Mission Command says, hey, um, I want you guys, if you see something that fits within what we're trying to do, I want you to act on it. And and move ahead. You don't have to be the greatest fighting force if you are if you're if, if the enemy is always reacting to your initiative creating events. Is that correct? Right. That's the OODA loop. That's John Boyd's OODA loop. But on top of your your little round top examples, excellent example of a case study. The real hero of Little Round Top, Chamberlain was a stud, don't get me wrong. For sure. I'm not realizing what he did. But his brigade commander, Strong Vincent was the real hero of Gettysburg. And this is why. This is what I'm talking about. He was in the Army of Potomac, which at the, up to that time was a zero defects organization because that's what George McClellan, the commander of the Army of Potomac, wanted. He didn't want any errors. didn't want him to make bad. So you didn't do anything without an order. That Army re- retained it and remained that way largely until Grant took it over and broke it of that a year later, 64. By that time, uh, General Governor Warren, the chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac, was up on Little Round Top, and he could see what Longstreet was coming and was was building up around three o'clock, three or four o'clock. Was getting ready to assault with his corps, and Warren says, "I need troops, anybody up here." So he found out. Well, the Fifth Corps is below, is a mile away from me to the to the northeast. I'll send a runner or courier to find out with the order and then the army of Potomac has to go from the core commander down yeah. to get that order. 
So what does what does Vincent do? Vincent sees the courier looking for his division commander Barnes and his corps commander Sykes, which are Ford, but they couldn't find them. So Vincent says, "Let me let, let me see what the order is." Oh, General Warren, the chief engineer of the army, needs forces up on Little Round Top. I will take responsibility and move my brigade up there right now. In that army, if he moved his brigade up there and it was a mistake, he would get court-martialed and relieved. Yeah. So that was a thing. And then when he gets up there, if you see the scene from the movie Gettysburg from 1993, when Chamberlain is getting is the commander's intent from Vincent, that's a. I used to show that to my cadets at Georgetown. That is a perfect example of concise commander's intent. He didn't tell him how to do it. He just said, look, Chamberlain, I want you to defend here. The enemy's coming within a few minutes from this way. I want you to defend here because this is the reason. But he didn't tell him how to do it. That is a great scene to show in a video in a class to young people. This is a great commander's intent. So Strong Vincent, and he got killed, of course, uh, right after – about 1740 or 1800 that evening, got killed there, along with all his regimental commanders except for uh, Chamberlain. So, But Vincent is the hero of Gettysburg, in my opinion. Why? Because he had the moral courage to see the situation. He exemplifies what mission command is all about. The other thing, I, I guess we could use a more recent example, you know, and, and I'm going to be unfair because I don't know enough about the tactical situation to say it, but I, but I know it, Don, I know it when I see it, you know, we have three primary responses, fight, flight, or freeze. And when that Parkland shooting yes. happened, that deputy was not empowered. was not trusted or, or simply was not provisioned to do what everybody wants him to do, which is go into that school and, and get after that shooter. So um, there's definitely a leadership problem there. I mean, the execution of the sheriff, of the deputy, I, I, don't, I, I don't see that as being a deputy problem. I see that as being a sheriff problem. Am, am I getting that right in terms of... Well, there's a, cult, a culture problem there. You're right. But in a, in a culture, you're exactly right. It was, a, it was the sheriff of the county there, his problem, I forgot his name, uh, but he was very political, very risk-averse, and of course that filtered down. But still... What is the end state? What is your mission there right. to protect the children? So that guy, that deputy, is still very, very guilty. You're in a culture of mission command. You're saying the successful outcome is the defense of these children and no children get hurt, or I can minimize that. That's all he cares about. And that's why the Germans did all, utmost to develop leaders with character, strength of character. Balkenstein, which is the, their term for strength of character or the joy of taking responsibility. That's what you want in a culture. So even when you had that negative sheriff's culture, you still had that that deputy would have recognized, oh, my success, even if it cost me my job, is protecting these children. So, yeah. But that, but like you said, there was not even a culture of optics tactic there. Yeah. But still, in a culture, even if you had already established a culture of mission command, and that new sheriff came on and said, no, don't do anything until I tell you to, which you see all over the country now, especially among fire departments, where they go, I'll get there and make the decision when firemen should be able to get there early and and make the decision. So so you're exactly right. But but still, it was up to that deputy to say, my ultimate ultimate duty is to protect those children. Yeah. And I, I let's just go back and say this again, too. But that wasn't his ultimate duty, right? Not at least not according to what he understood in terms of execution. His job was to be there at the school and handle things as they came in. And he became more of an administrator than an operator because ultimately that was his day-to-day mission. Right. Was to be an administrator and not someone who was primarily there to ensure the right. safety of those kids. And, and that's not to put anything on him. That's to illustrate the problem of this is what Mission Command looks like. So in a business setting, you know, you're, you're working at, oh, I don't know, pick a company, uh, Chick-fil-A. And they, I, I, they yeah. probably are a good example of Mission Command. The, the customer care at- They're a very Chick- good example of Mission Command at the business level because they have uh-huh. a value system about looking professional, serving the customer, being, being courteous, putting out a good product. 
and then they take care of their employees. See, there's loyalty is a two way street. This is what people forget. Again, Boyd's right. Your people are your most important asset, but it's a two way street. I'm going to give you the, the 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 culture of Mission Command at Chick Fil A, okay? And you're going to uphold the value system of the company, and as a result, the company makes good money, gets good sales. You keep your job, possibly even get promoted. Yeah. Uh, in return, you work for a company that you can be proud of, and uh, and keep your employment. But I'm also going to allow you to do it as long as you do it by the value system. Uh, any way you see fit. I've seen that when I've eaten in there, how they run. So, so you're exactly right. That's a, there's a, another good example. I wish I had the name. There was an article last week about how cyber command, uh, recently took down ISIS. Mm. It's an open source magazine article, but it was really good. But in the magazine article, they flattened the organization because they allowed the cyber warriors, the computer hacker experts, that goes straight to the general about making decisions rapidly to let them do what they had to do. And as a result, they completely took down the ISIS network and it stayed down. Yeah, that's interesting. The ability to take those steps. Uh, well, today's guest on the show is Eric Kleinsmith. He was my commander from the 165th MI Battalion, part of 5th Corps, by the way. Uh, and in what he did, what he was uh, in, in Intel was he built a, an AI machine that started to track trends, and they actually discovered Al Qaeda's cell in uh, Michigan near his hometown. But the the thing is, is that they yeah. had no purchase outside of their small little room. So they have this like, hey, there's something worth looking into, but they had no voice with the higher command, and so no ability to execute. So even still, gotcha. like just because you know something and you're first to the party with the knowledge. If you have no weight with the action arm, then again you have a problem with mission command. Well, how how do we how do we deal with that? Where you know you you've got the 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 techie folks are solving a problem, but you know they don't have a voice. So the question is is when you have a bunch of tech guys solving a problem, but they don't have a voice with the command because you know they're they're in the uh, you know they're in a sub cube on a skiff you know, doing some kind of thing it, to get the word out to turn it into actionable items. It, it's really hard. What part of Mission Command is that unit failing at? I, it has to go back again. You, first of all, you have to train people on Mission Command with, so there's really good tools to use. And that's what we outline in the book. I show the how uh, of how to do that, the, what's important. Uh, for example, when we wrote, uh, 36 or 18 uh, different chapters in two two anthologies, Mission Command 1 and 2, over the last two years, the favorite part of that was part three with the how-to. Mm. You know, people wanted to know, how do you do this? That's my complaint against the Army manuals that talk about Mission Command. They need to give you, like, this cyber uh, task force in NSC that took down ISIS. They need to show examples like that. This is Mission Command. What did they do first? They had highly professional people come in and they set, they did a number of war games and they discovered we can't do the typical hierarchical military organization where it has to go through all these widgets to get a decision uh, or we won't be able to do what we want to do. And when they discovered that, they cut out all the middle layers, a lot of layers, and they sped up their decision cycle or their OODA loop to enable them to make decisions as they were going through uh, and taking out this ISIS network. So when you do a number of war games and free play exercises, you start realizing, you start setting up uh, operating procedures on how to conduct mission command. And you will find traditional hierarchical organizations uh, cannot do it. One, a lot of it's to do with egos, egos, Oh, I made so-and-so rank, so I'm better than this person. Well, that don't fly these days. You've got a highly professional force that, yeah, you're maybe the wisest person in the room, but also the wisest, smartest person in the room says, I'm surrounded by smart people, and I can flatten out the decision cycle as long as under, everyone understands the outcome and the parameters we're operating under. 
Yeah, this goes back to commander's intent. So let me ask you about this a little bit because yeah, you know, I've got a lot of time sitting in a lot of, I've seen a lot of different units in the same environment responding to, to the commander's intent. And like you said, you can't have four number yeah. one priorities, but often this is how the military responds. The commander will ask himself a question out loud. I, I wonder, and everybody grabs their pen and they take that like a tasking. Meanwhile, you know, that moral courage to go, he's just wondering something out loud. That's not going to, I already know what the mission is. He's already given me my orders. Nothing about this is specifically, you know, trumping that, you know. So for, for example, a, a battalion commander might have a mission of uh, close with and destroy the enemy, but the enemy can't be found and won't be closed with. So uh, we'll get to that later. Um, force protection. Again, we're on a giant American camp. And uh, uh, force protection isn't really the number one priority. And if it was, we should just go home. Uh, three, teach and train and create capacity within the local indigenous forces and government. And then there's four, enable the enablers to go out and, and you know, provide those, those capabilities. When I look at that, I understand that line number three is the critical thing. Everything else is sort of secondary to that. You know, if you... Maybe the enablers moving on the battlefield is more important because if they don't get to the people, then that's good. But really, where I'm going to focus is, are we creating capacity with these people? So any subtasking, any wonder, any in, in, any intent um, that comes outside of that, I, I'm going to I'm going to make a you know, it, it's a priority, but not a high priority. The, the deal here is, yeah, when when I worked with the Afghans in Afghanistan, I would use my teaching methods that I outline in the book and the younger Afghanistan officers and sergeants loved it. Why? Because they were, I was explaining the why I was, they were not memorizing anything. They had to figure out stuff, but I was allowing them to figure out stuff in a, in a, uh, uh, a fail safe environment. And they had never okay. experienced because all their courses. Oh, I'll give you a good one. I, I taught TDGs to, some of their military academy cadets. They were brand new lieutenants out of their, like our West Point. And at the end of it, where they were in totally involved and immersed in the development, a lot of them came by and said, can you go over to our school and teach our teachers how to teach? Because they were totally into rope memorization. And, and that's a different culture right there. And they were, they had been fascinated the fact that I involved them. They were make, having to make decisions in front of their peers and justify it, but there was no consequence other than they were learning how to make better decisions rapidly under pressure. So the stuff works. I, I've done it in different cultures. Uh, and so that worked. Right. Really and I guess uh, going back to what I was kind of, the illustration I was making was that yeah. we'll all leave from that staff room, not with the same guidance, the same intent, you know, maybe our own specific uh, subunit commander, uh, is the person that we're seeking to serve. Or maybe we're trying to close with the enemy that won't be closed with. And that becomes our number one priority. So now you have this this room full of, and maybe some of them are focused on answering the I wonder question. And so now you have this, uh, people are empowered, right? They have quote unquote yeah. mission command, but but there's no unity of effort. Yeah, the, you're, like you mentioned, the commander's intent is so important. And in, in development learning, it's the outcome, the learning outcome. But the key to the commander's intent is not, not breaking it down into three parts, which the military does. It's just a well-written, concise paragraph that says, the commander says, here's my vision of success. When, when the smoke clears, be it in business or the battle, at my level, this is what I deem as success looks like mm, okay. and that goes two levels down uh and he will also maybe said here's the limitations he doesn't say how he doesn't say uh how but he does say why why we're doing this and Moltke the elder the command chief of general staff from 1858 to 1888 uh stated that in in uh, his field manual of large units he stated that you all, the subordinate will only be given enough information for them to accomplish their mission. No more, no less. They will mm -hmm. only be given what they need to know 
to accomplish their mission. What he said that he had saw the exercises in 1858 where they had monstrous thick orders like we see today. Uh, we even see orders for going into the range that are 70 pages long. But instead of like empowering, making people figure it out, we want right. no mistakes at all. But as a result, people get in a culture where they've got to be, con and I see this all the time, they've constantly got to be told when and what and where to, and what to do, how to do it. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. When and what and where to, and what to do, how to do it. And then we say we practice mission command. I'll give you yeah. a, a psychological example. In okay. my county, Northern Virginia, you see stoplights everywhere. They're they're over addicted to safety. That's their claim. And they have stoplights even to turn right. And I see people when there's any any change at all. There was a study done in Wells on traffic circles comparing American and British drivers. And in these traffic circles, there's no rules and no signs. People just know what to do. In America, everything's dictated, especially by stoplights, when and what, what you're going to do. So sure. when you see any change at all, when there's not a stoplight on or the stoplight changes suddenly, people don't know what to do because they're used to being told what to do. Mm -hmm. That happens in a culture of top-down zero defects. So people, they give up their critical thinking in return for security or safety. But – you have in a stable environment, that's fine. In, a, in an environment that doesn't change, uh, which is not warfare, that's fine. In a non vibrant a government agency, that might be fine. But in business, it's a big failure. All right. So, so I'm going to push you a little bit with this and, and see, see how, we, how we do. Uh, here, here's what I've learned from modern combat. The enemy does not show up unless they want to, and they often do it via remote. They, they use drones, just like we do. They might, it might be an IED. They might send a, a civilian with a bomb in a car. They, they don't fight how we want them to fight. In the meantime, the military is looking for the enemy desperately, but cannot pick a fight with anybody. So a unit can go and try to close with and destroy the enemy, but they can't get within a block or a mile of them face to face. But that doesn't change what, what the infantry commander wants their soldiers to do. They want them to go out, close with, and destroy. So if that fight won't happen, what does it take for a commander who has excellent mission command to adjust fire and focus more on that capacity mission? Or the command, look, here's, here's, here's the mistake about mission command. Let me hear it. People think it's all or nothing, just like outcomes-based learning or what mm -hmm. used to be outcomes-based training. The, the important thing, Pete, is you might want to choose a directive or prescriptive chain uh, uh, command style if you have a new unit. Or, like you just said, say you can't close with the enemy. Maybe the leader has to go up there and he's got to get the mission accomplished, Okay he has to go up there and lead by example. And at that point, what we would call micromanagement, make things happen. <clears throat> Maybe a couple of key leaders that knew how to do things were wounded or killed. So he's got a, under, under a culture of optics, tactic, mission command, you need to choose the appropriate command style at the appropriate time. And again, that takes a lot of development. Okay. Uh, there's been a lot written on that by, uh, of course, Dr. Bruce Goodmanson and Mark, Dr. Martin Samuels uh, on, on command styles. So there's a lot of good references out there. Uh, but what mission command is, is choosing the correct method at the time based on the situation to succeed. And that takes a lot of reputation repetitions in war games and tactical decision games and exercises to get there. They're not expensive. That's the, the issue. They're not expensive to do, but they take imaginations and they take some time. But if people do it and they spend the time developing their subordinates to do it, it will pay off big time. See what, what 
my biggest criticism of our learning is we do it once and we don't allow people to go back and do it again under different conditions. So we'll put, put people in a scenario, they'll do it. And then, oh, okay, we'll do an AAR, which is normally not done right. Cause an AAR should be ran by the students who identify what they did good and bad, but we'll do it. And then we'll go to our next, we'll check the block and move to the next event because we've got to cram all this stuff in, in our POIs. And I talk a lot about that in the book as well. As one uh, one review I got today said, I'm very uh, I'm very uh, diplomatically critical of Tradoc. Yeah, because Tradoc yeah. still is on the industrial model. The industrial model is training a lot of mass people on the basics, and then hoping they learn more when that once they get into combat. You are right about that, and I am equally critical of Tradoc because damn it, they should they should have been learning all this time. Uh, one of the things that I think requires the most courage in the battlefield I've, I've seen is when you have an Afghan leader or an Iraqi leader start to take charge. We're talking a governor here. We need to have a government. What, one of the biggest problems we ever had in these modern wars is that there was no state. So we, yeah. instead of focusing on the state, we focused on projects and everything. And we would just override that local governor. And I encountered one one commander who said, wait, this governor will create a plan that we can get behind and follow? And, yeah. and then this was the biggest thing I learned. There's only room for one sword in the scabbard. And if that Afghan leader was willing to be the sword, even if it's a shitty, un, like, cracked old sword, that is the fucking sword. But it takes incredible moral courage to, to not impose yeah. your will as yeah. an infantry commander. Yeah, you're right. You're exactly right. I like that one saber in the, in the scabbard. That's a good yeah. one. Yeah. Well, it reframes it. And then you have to turn around and look at your captains as the colonel and say, don't you dare be the sword. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and, and you have to be crystal clear because here is a moment to change the fight. You know, everybody needs to get behind this guy's plan and don't over provision it, provision it within his model. You know, yeah. be, be a staff, listen to the commander. And that's, that's what, you know, really great mission command is. But, it's terrifying and it's completely against how we are taught and trained. Oh, and, and this teaching goes back to when we start public schools because our public schools use, uses what's called the competency model that was first uh, used by New York city public schools in 1905. And it's used to train industrial factory workers. That's why you have the bells and the breaks and the, the 50 minute time periods, but it's all about rope memorization. Leave no child behind is rote memorization training for the test. There's no critical thinking in it. There's no. There's a lot of knowledge involved, uh, but there's not a lot of uh, emotional intelligence or critical thinking involved. And that's what mission command requires. So the book, the book not only tells you some tools to use and, and examples on how to do it, but I have two chapters in there about uh, two successful organizations that use it. One is a School, the Army Recon Course, currently at Fort Benning, which is still using outcomes-based learning. And I just heard from one of the instructors the other day. And it, what's what's funny is not funny; it's sad. Is they have a curriculum for trade to inspect, and then what they do for real. But the students mm. absolutely—it's the best learning experience they've ever gone through. The Army Recon Course at Benning is uh, 28 days long. And it's for uh, lieutenants, uh, s staff sergeants, and E7s that are going to take over a scout platoon. But the course is all outcomes-based learning that that parallels what mission command is. They have to figure out everything. Now the, the instructors are there; they guide them through it. They're I, they call I call them facilitators, but they make you figure out everything, even what packing list you have. And you and I have both been to schools where everything's told, you've told everything to do, how to yeah. do it, when to do it, everything. That's not critical thinking. I was just working with Marine Corps OCS, some great cadre there that are trying to get away from that and, 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 and really know how to develop adaptability at the very beginning. There's also a chapter on the 4th Armored Division that was commanded by John Shirley Wood for most of his existence from the time it was created in June 42 until he was relieved, unfortunately, in November 
44 for exhaustion. Really what was the problem was he didn't get along well with his core commander who, who was a very micromanager, but he was one of Marshall's favorites. But John Shirley Wood was the Germans consider him a true panzer leader or tank leader. Uh, but he led his division with no orders. John Shirley Wood, one of the finest commanders we've ever developed. And I'll have a whole entire chapter on that. All my sources are primary from his own papers at Syracuse. Interviews with former deputy commanders of his that I did years ago. <laughs> one of them was General Ed Bouts, who was at the time Major Bouts. S3 for Critton and Abrams in the 37th Armor, who was part. Critton and Abrams was mentored by John Shirley Woods. Uh, John Shirley Woods, the first thing he said when they got to Normandy and deployed for Operation Cobra at the end of July was no written orders. We don't do, run this. We, we operate too fast for written orders as a division commander. Yeah. I've talked. I've given that talk to many people. And always the retired guy said, there's no way you can run a division without thick orders, big, thick phone book orders. And this guy did it. Why? Because he trained that way. And I talk about how he did it all the time. Uh, He had them for two years before he got to Normandy and they trained constantly on changing the order, changing the situation, empowering people. Uh, So he was the master at how to do this. There's other guys I talk about in there, Colonel Casey Haskins, who's one of the best trainers the Army ever produced. He developed outcomes-based training education, which we renamed to outcomes-based learning, so it encompasses all learning. But Casey Haskins, from 2006 to 2012, took three different organizations and based it on mission command, and they were extraordinary organizations. So I talk about all those examples in there so people to say, oh, this is not a book on theory. This is a book. Hey, these guys really did this. And and best of all, on the back cover where you always got the endorsements, who are the endorsements by? They're not by retired generals or senators or famous people. They're by guys that practice and use this stuff. Right. Uh, there's there's yeah. five endorsements on the back by uh, Doug McGregor, uh, Jeff Nell, who's a Sar- Ranger Sergeant Major, uh, Will Foley, who's a green retired Green Beret, Fred Leland, as you know, yeah. and Chad Foster, who's a colonel in the cavalry. They've all employed this stuff. It works. Uh, it makes their made their units and their organizations better than their peers. So there's a lot of evidence there. Like this guy's just not talking about a, a, a fantasy or hoping it works. It's applied in bin work, and the sources are primary sources from the Germans and, and, and uh, American successes in the past, the French, and so forth. I spent six years on this. So there's a lot so, of stuff cramped. Maybe that's why it's a high-priced book because uh, Naval Institute Press, which is one of the top academic presses, realized I spent six years on it. Yeah, trying to get you paid. Uh, so why is it that we love our Prussians so much and, and Napoleon? I mean, it seems like we could find examples from a more, you know, relevant to the modern fight uh, system. You know, we're talking about people that were digging entrenchments and, and battles and, and things that just don't happen the way that they happen now. Oh, you've got... When we wrote the Mission Command Anthology 1 and 2, we have chapters in there about people that practice Mission Command, like David Hackworth in Vietnam. Uh, And what was cool about that chapter is Jerry Long, Major Jerry Long of the British Army, wrote the chapter. It's a great chapter on David Hackworth, how he turned around 1-9 Infantry and made it an incredible unit. But first he started on establishing what was important. And then he started empowering people and he developed his subordinates to understand mission orders without telling them how to do it. Uh, th- there's a lot of cases throughout it. There's airborne examples. Cause as you know, airborne units, once they're on the ground, they got to operate out of contact. Uh, yeah. so we have chapters on that. So Americans have a lot of great examples of mission command. The problem is 
we were addicted to the management science approach, the top down approach, because our career personnel system uh, is is very antiquated. Yeah. So that's our as program. as we're talking, I'm looking at an upcoming conference for the military advising the SFAB folks. There's a whole bunch yeah. of people coming in trying to figure out this whole greater uh, advising advising mission that we seem to have adopted as a military. And uh, a lot of what I'm going to tell them is is not top down things, you know, like they're desperate to know how do we tackle language capacity? Well, you yeah. don't because, you know, what's what's surprising that we, we spend a year and a half teaching somebody to be shitty at Korean and their first assignment is in Germany, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all the time we do that. So. It's not about language capacity. It's about the ability to adapt to any cultural situation and use an interpreter at the professional level. Yeah. But I will tell you right now, Don, nobody's got a, a, uh, a horse blanket that has a big wedge of that thing taken up by interpreter training. It's all about distrust and, and, and trying to reduce harm and threat as opposed to how do I take this interpreter and make them part me and part my partner? Exactly. You're right. You're, you've got good insights. The The advisor role, more than any role, demands mission command. But the stuff I saw in, in Afghanistan, how top down we were, was incredible. But what really hurt mission command, too, over in Afghanistan was a constant rollover of people. Yeah. Constantly coming and going. Uh, yeah. A contractors provide stability. But again, we hate contractors for whatever reason. I don't know. But there's the, 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 the myth out there that they're all bad and we can't trust them, but that's the only stability we have in those places. Uh, For and sure. the military kills itself by constantly rotating people in and out. And yeah. then, and then they're so afraid of something happening that there's layer after layer of control. So it, it, it can't be mission command. And then you come back here to the States and it's the same thing, layer after layer of control, layer to layer after mandatory training because our senior leaders can't tell Congress, we don't have an, we don't have an issue with this. We don't, if we train hard, we don't need to do all these mandatory training things. Okay. <laughs> Most soldiers, 90% of soldiers are good people and don't do these things. Yeah. We have bad apples. We get rid of them, but we need to focus on being warriors, not political correctness. Yeah. That yeah, under you my because you know what the most important aspect to make mission command uh, is? Tell me. Trust. Yeah, trust, trust, right? And to build trust, you have to be professional. And to be mm -hmm. professional, you have to study all the time and practice and, and learn from that practice, reflect on it, uh, listen to and learn from your mistakes. But in our environment, you, you're not allowed to make those mistakes. You don't have time to reflect because there's so much crammed into the training schedule. And I yeah. talk a lot about that in the book, too. Yeah, there's not a lot of space in those training schedules. And, and as someone that's worked at TRADOC, I've heard any number of occasions, let's say um, this 15-week this, uh, uh, block of training now needs to be 12. It's not because there's been a study like to what, you know, what can we take out. It's just cram it into this hole because of money, you know. And it's like, well, they won't cram into that hole. So what are we sacrificing? Oh, no, no. You have to teach everything. Like, well, that's just not possible. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> like wow. if you think we're doing nothing all day, then okay. But the reality is we're all busy. We're all at max capacity because we have to, you know, do these. Can I do less PowerPoint presentations? No. Okay. Well, then we're, <laughs> we're going to run out of time exactly. and resources. Yeah. Yeah. The big thing again is like we were examining one course. Uh, they were talking about teaching history, military history, uh, Marine Corps military history, and they wanted to cram 200 years of Marine Corps history in four hours. Well, what normally they do is try to make everybody learn everything, and they do it by lecture. Actually, the best way to do that is take a couple of case studies. A good one for young officers would be O'Bannon in Libya and uh, with the Barbary Pirates, and maybe uh, something out of Tara or Guadalcanal that a lieutenant did. And you do two case studies in four hours where you make sure the, the students are involved. It's, it, you involve your students. You should only talk 20, 
20% of the time. And now they're re- they're taking ownership of the learning. And now when they leave your class, they'll take it upon themselves to study more about the history. But when all you do is cram so much in there that people are sleeping, they're falling asleep. Uh, they don't have time to really reflect. That's important. That's what happens. But again, it's because people don't understand how the brain works, how it learns. Okay. And I've got that in there too in the book about what the leading learner in the United States, Dr. Robert Bork out at UCLA talks about that. So he, he gave a briefing to Tradoc in 2006 called How We Train is, is Backwards. How We Learn is Backwards. Huh. It's online too, the briefing. is. is it, he was a great lecturer. Uh, but the point is we try to create, we try to make rope memorization. We don't use case studies. We don't break it up and mix it up. That's how people learn better through experience and through, uh, mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. But that's part of mission command. Getting the, the book is about how to develop people to succeed at mission command. The reason why I'm so good when I'm in the field and good, yeah. good at war is because I've made all the mistakes enough times that I got sick of making them. You know, you you learn from them. Yeah. Yeah. There wasn't a book for doing what I did. I had to just, you know, I had to invent it myself. And and it turns out there were books for it, but those things weren't made available. So I had to relearn something that already existed. And you're right. It was just repetition, constant mistakes and going make fewer of those mistakes, make fewer of those mistakes until finally I had a system that I not only could could describe but I had tested in the field, but it's like, this is the system. And then yeah. I improved the system Then I improved it. And this is Don, this is unit to unit. Like this is new commander comes in. I have a system. It works. I've done it. Okay, great. Yeah. And then next time I have a system, I've done it for two different commanders. Do you want the outcomes here? They, you know, so this is a real thing, but again, it was, it was done because I was left alone to make those mistakes and deliver the things that they wanted most. So, you know, it's, it's, I was fortunate to have commanders that really, you know, letting me do what I needed to do didn't cost them anything and they yeah. got big benefit from it. So I don't know if it was necessarily mission command, but it was for sure the courage to allow me to do what I did. Well, you're hitting on the, again, there's a trust pattern that was developed, but yeah. in the, in the learning, in the learning part of our careers, we should be able to, we should be put in situations where we can make a mistake, but learn from it. And then, allowed under different conditions to do another scenario where we apply this learning. We don't, the worst thing you want to do is repeat, uh, repeat the scenario. You want to change the conditions, which I, the thousands of hours that I've studied German officer develop in the late 1800s and early 1900s, they would constantly change the conditions. But when the lessons learned continually to build up, the other thing is, again, you've got to, you've got to create an environment where the student is involved in the learning It's student centric learning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, not, yeah what you're not, describing not also. Individual. Yeah, go ahead. When, when we try to develop uh, cultural knowledge, CQ is what it's called. Yeah. When we try to develop cultural acuity, you're describing the process that, that it takes to do that. Be immersed into different cultural environments, whether you're in a brigade staff room, division staff room, yeah. or, or a village cluster in some foreign country with a foreign language, foreign religion. You know, the, the more you can learn how to operate in different cultural environments with, the, you know, and take culture and use it to your advantage, yeah. the greater cultural acuity you have. But you have to go out and actually do it. You have to participate. You have to yeah. go make mistakes and, and figure out what your style is. It's it's no different than, you know, a martial art practice where you have to go out and you have to get choked out a hundred times. Yeah. So you can stop that those two different moves that you keep getting choked out on. Well and, and, and the right martial arts will the master will pause and talk to you about what you did wrong and you'll get critiques from your peers. Yeah. That's yeah. like a really well done tactical decision game or what West Point calls tactical decision exercise. The learning takes place when the course of action that was selected by the student that's up on the podium uh, is from their peers comments. That's where the learning takes place while the yeah. instructor is facilitating. 
Well, listen, everybody, this book is called Adopting Mission Command, Developing Leaders for a Superior Command Culture. It's written by Don Vandergriff. And as you can hear, like he knows a lot about how to get the outcomes that you're trying to get, how to develop Mission Command, how to create that command culture that's superior to the others. Don, I just want to thank you for coming on and sharing some time with me. Let's not have it be 500 something episodes between the next visit. No, and, and appreciate you, brother. I'm serious. This is great, and it won't be, okay? Thank you for what you're doing, and keep up the good work.